I'm going to be in the book of Leviticus, and I want to show you how the book of Leviticus breaks down your standing and your state. Now, in the first seven chapter, you see the offerings. And all those offerings, they picture something about Jesus Christ. So when you're reading it, don't think, well, this don't have nothing to do with me. Because it does, because it pictures the offering, the perfect offering that saved you. Now, those offerings that they did, they couldn't save them. It only got them temporary forgiveness. They were waiting on, they had. They didn't know Jesus Christ was going to die on the cross for their sins, but they had to wait in paradise in the heart of the earth when they died for Jesus Christ to be the perfect ultimate sacrifice. And then they could get his blood applied to them so that they could go to heaven. But when I accepted Jesus Christ's offering for sin, I believed on him. He saved me, and ever since then, my standing in Christ has been perfect. And your standing never changes either. This is because it is based off of Jesus Christ's righteousness and not your own. Now, these Old Testament offerings, they picture the perfect offering. And if you copied those exact offerings from the book of Leviticus today, it wouldn't do anything for you because it's no longer the blood of bulls and goats. The blood of goats and calves can't take away sin, but they picture something. For example, the meat offering. How does that picture Jesus? Well, in John 4, 32, he said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. The trespass offering, Colossians 2, 13, it says he's forgiven us all trespasses. A burn offering, in John 19, 28, it said, he said he thirsted. He took our hell when he was on the cross. Jesus is our burn offering. The sin offering, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He's our sin offering. And then peace offering, Colossians 1.20, Having made peace through the blood of his cross. What about the heave offering? In Leviticus 7.14, it says, And of it shall he offer one out of the whole oblation for an heave offering unto the Lord. And it shall be the priest that sprinkleth the blood of the peace offerings. So the heave offering has to do with the movement of the sacrifice. It's lifted up. They had to heave it up. It was lifted up. Well, how does that represent Jesus? Well, in John 3, 14, Jesus said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. It pictures Jesus Christ being lifted up on the cross. So that's... The first seven chapters about those offerings. And while they did those offerings to get temporary forgiveness for sin, we have the perfect offering, Jesus Christ, that gives us eternal forgiveness. Now, chapter 10, Nadab and Abihu, they offer strange fire. And what is that picture? The Lord knows when you have fake fire. Don't be a pretender. Paul talks about having faith unfeigned. That is faith that's not pretended. The, Lord's, the Lord knows if your standing is in him or if you have fake righteousness. The world can't see your standing, but the Lord can. And that's a difference between your standing versus your state. Now, the first 10 chapters remind us of our standing. The rest of the book reminds us of our state and how we need to be sanctified, that is, set apart. The more sanctified or set apart you live, the more your state will match your standing. Your state changes from one moment to the next, however you're living at any given moment. If you're living bad, then you're in a bad state. If you're living good, then that's a better state. But your standing never changes. It's based on Jesus Christ and his righteousness and not your own. And that righteousness was applied to your record at salvation, and that's why you can't lose salvation. And it remains perfect regardless of what you do. Your state never changes from one moment to the next. It can never affect your standing. Now, chapter 11. You got the chapter on clean and unclean animals. It says in Leviticus 11, 2 and 3, Speaking to the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof and is cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. So this pictures 
how as Christians you need to talk the talk and walk the walk. If you're going to have a good state, if you want to try to make your state to match your standing as close as you can, then you need to talk the talk and walk the walk. Don't just talk like a Christian, but walk like one too. You see, these animals, they had to part the hoof and chew the cud. That or the were the ones they could eat. So you got to part the hoof and chew the chew the cud, not just chew the cud and part part not the hoof. And James one twenty two says, "But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only." I mean, you need to do it. Don't just hear it. Don't just talk it, but do it. Now, when it comes to these clean and unclean animals, if you eat any of these animals that are considered unclean, it's not going to actually make you unclean today. Because things changed. Today, we can eat anything. I mean, you could even eat a hairless cat if you wanted to. I mean, that's sick. But you could. And it wouldn't be wrong. Because Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, 3 through 5, Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received, with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So Paul is pretty much saying every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. If you can give God thanks for it, you can eat it. Colossians 2.16 Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath day. So you can, you can eat any meat. It's not like it was under the Old Testament law. Now, Leviticus 11 also talks about unclean birds. And these unclean birds picture unclean spirits. In Revelation 18.2, it says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So, you got birds there with foul spirits and they're called unclean and hateful birds. Now look at this in Leviticus eleven thirteen through 19. And these are they which ye shall have an abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle and the ossifrage and the osprey and the vulture and the kite after his kind, every raven after his kind, and the owl and the night hawk and the cuckow however you say that, and the hawk after his kind, and the little owl, and the cormorant, and the great owl, and the swan, and the pelican, and the gyre eagle, and the stork, the heron after her kind, and the lapwing, and the bat. So the unclean birds picture unclean spirits. Why do you think they have movies like The Birds? Uh, why do they have video games called Angry Birds? Why are there always vultures and ravens in the horror movies? And that scene is scary. Uh, I think there is even a, a horror novel or something called The Raven. When people supposedly get ad abducted, they many times see an owl at their window. And I think people are really experiencing something because you got so many different people from different continents experiencing these abductions, whatever they may be, and they claim to see an owl, an owl in the window. So, the Bible turns out to be right all the way around. Now, in chapter 12, you got purification after childbirth. And you think, wow, how can I apply this to myself? Well, in Leviticus 12, 2 through 3, it says, Speaking to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed, and born a man-child, and she shall be unclean seven days, according to the days of the separation for her infirmity, shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Once you are born again, you then work on cleaning up your life. It's a process. So what this pictures is, the chapter's talking about purification after childbirth. The moment you're born into the family of God, you be, then begin to work on purification. You work on a slow process I mean, it, it's quicker for some people than others. But it may be a slow process of cleaning up your life day by day through reading the scriptures and praying. 
and getting yourself as close to how the Bible would want you to be as you possibly can. It's purification after a birth. See, if the, you're born first time to your mother, you're born the second time when you get saved. That's being born again. And after you're born again, you want to get yourself transformed. In Romans 12, 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So this is showing you. The book of Leviticus breaks down your standing and your state. Chapter 12 shows you purification after childbirth. Now, chapter 13, leprosy, a picture of sin. So this is going to give you instructions about leprosy. And it pictures sin after salvation. You're still going to struggle with sin. That's why your state always changes. Sometimes you don't give in to sin. Sometimes you do. You see, leprosy, like sin, it spreads much faster than the coronavirus. People living in sin can make you dirty. They can make you sick. Like leprosy, it can rub off on you. That's why Paul says, Come out from among them and be ye separate in 2 Corinthians 6.17. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. In Ephesians 5, 11, he says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Number two, leprosy gets in your clothes. Sin even gets in your clothes. Many times the sin a person is doing reflects in their clothes. Leviticus thirteen forty seven: The garment also that the plague of leprosy is in, whether it be woolen or, uh, garment or a linen garment. So you see, it can get in the clothes. And the tribulation epistle, Jude, speaks of garments being spotted by the flesh. Jude 23, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. The mark of the beast comes with a leprosy-like plague from the Lord, and it gets in clothes. Revelation 16, 2, And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which had worshipped his image. So you see how Leviticus, it, it shows us something historically, how they dealt with leprosy. It shows us something devotionally, how it pictures sin in our life, and then it shows us something prophetically, how... Uh, there's going to be something like this in the tribulation that they're going to face, which is the grievous sore that comes on the men that take the mark. And another thing about leprosy is that it takes divine intervention to cure it. In Leviticus 13, 46, All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled, he is unclean, he shall dwell alone, without the camp shall his habitation be. And it takes divine intervention to cure him. The lost man is without hope and without God in the world. It takes divine intervention to cure the lost man. The, the man with leprosy had to be seen by the priest. We got to go to our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 14, you got the law of cleansing leprosy and leprosy in the house. Leprosy is like sin. It gets in your clothes and it gets in your house. It spreads like a plague and it gets worse with time. So to keep yourself clean, make sure you clean house and get rid of sinful things in your house. Leviticus 14.14, 14, And the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering, and the priest shall put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. So you're the, you read that and you think, what in the world? So he takes the blood, puts it on his right ear, his right hand, and his right foot. That shows you how you need to listen to the right things, because he put it on his ear, you need to walk in the right places because he put it on his foot. And you need to use the right things because he put it on his hand. Chapter 15, you got uncleanness in marriage relationships. So make sure God is in your marriage. Keeping your marriage holy is part of a holy and clean living. That's part of keeping your state good. That's part of sanctification. And then in chapter 15, it talks about washing stuff in running water. This would have saved lives if people knew this a long time ago. Washing your hands in running water. That's how you get rid of germs. In Leviticus 15, 13, it says, And when he that hath an issue is cleansed of his issue, then he shall, run, uh, then he shall number to himself seven days for his cleansing and wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in running water and shall be clean. See, people was just washing their hands in a bucket of water. 
and then somebody else would come and wash wash their hands in that same bucket of water. If they had washed them in running water, it would have got rid of the germs. But they didn't know that. But the Bible had it in there all along. Chapter 16, you got the scapegoat that pictures Jesus Christ bearing our sins. In Leviticus 16, 21 through 22. And chapter 17, you got rules against eating blood. And it's ruled against throughout all the Bible. So, I mean, Dracula, Vampirina, Edward from Twilight, they're all out of the will of God. They need to come down to an old-fashioned altar and get right because it's ruled against throughout all the Bible. They should not be eating blood. Chapter 18, you got sexual sins, and it's Pride Month, and they're celebrating these sexual sins that are right here in the book of Leviticus. Oh, they clean it up and make it look so so innocent. But if you got your Bible goggles on, it looks like... Uh, a graveyard like when i see the the target uh display of the pride month thing i got my bible goggles on so it doesn't look all sweet and innocent to me it looks like a graveyard to me but the thing that i like to show people is in leviticus 18 <coughs> not only does it speak against homosexuality but it speaks against adultery incest and bestiality you ask the average person on the street, is bestiality wrong? They say, yeah. Is incest wrong? Yeah. Is it wrong for a man to cheat on his wife? Obviously, they'll say, yeah. So why do they think homosexuality is okay when it's mentioned right in there along with those sins? It says, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Leviticus 18.22 Leviticus 18 is about sexual sins. Keeping your state and good condition involves staying away from sexual sins. Levit uh, Leviticus 19 teaches you just good morals. They easily apply to us today. Leviticus 19.11, you shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. Just real good practical truths right there. Chapter 20 warns against idolatry and black magic and witchcraft and sacrificing to devils and Things like that. So the Sanderson sisters are also out of the will of God. Their little book, I don't know if you noticed this, but when I was a kid, I noticed their little book has the one eye on their book. <coughs> but yeah, that this chapter warns against witchcraft, idolatry. Then chapter 21, proper conduct for Levitical priests and physical disqualifications for Old Testament priests. And we are priests today. The Lord has made us kings and priests. So if we want to keep our standing and st or keep our state in line, we need to go through the pa Pauline epistles, and not just the pa that's the main ones for us. See everything He's got to say for us. Try to do everything He says, and then the rest of the Bible too. We need to and rightly dividing it, filter it through the Pauline epistles. We don't just take the Pauline epistles, but we. That's our main one. That's our main one that we go by today. And while these qualifications for these priests, it doesn't match the qualifications for us being priests, but we can still get practical application from it. In chapter 22, you got more stuff about separation of Aaron and his sons, which they're the priests. Leviticus is about uh, uh, the priestly tribe the tribe of Levi, specifically Aaron and his sons. Chapter 23, you got all the feasts. Chapter 24, it talks about oil for the light. You never want the light to go out. And it also talks about capital punishment for murder. That's why we believe in capital punishment for murder that Paul even goes back into in the New Testament in Romans 13. In chapter 25, you got the Jubilee year. In chapter 26, you got the conditional nature of the Mosaic Law and more on sanctification. In chapter 27, you got laws about vows. So the book of Leviticus, it's got all kinds of amazing stuff in there. And if you read it, it, it really pictures your standing versus your state. Your standing never changes. It's, it's made perfect in Christ Jesus. Your state changes however you're living at any given moment. And the last, the the second part of Leviticus, it's 
telling the people how to live, what to do about leprosy, what to do about after birthing a child, what to do about what they should eat and shouldn't eat, how the priests should act, what type of priests they should take. You know, it's the Bible is a picture book. But this has been a quick lesson on the book of Leviticus.